This video is just one small part of a video where I compared anastrozole, exemestane, and letrozole. If you're interested in seeing those head-to-head -head comparisons, I'll link that at the end of the video. But before we get into this one, this is not medical advice. This should not be used to treat or diagnose medical conditions. This is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Let's get into this. Letrozole is hardcore. This is the heavy duty aromatase inhibitor. It's non-steroidal, so it just binds to the aromatase. It does not render it permanently inert, but we're gonna look at some of the literature. We're gonna bring in a lot of bro lore because the bro lore I think is more informative on letrozole use in men than some of the limited studies that we have. But I am gonna bring one in because there's some ancillary information that I think is worth discussing. But this study is called Letrozole Once a Week Normalizes Serum Testosterone in Obesity-Related Male Hypogonadism. It's from the abstract. Isolated hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is frequently observed in severely obese men, probably as a result of increased estradiol production and estrogen-mediated negative feedback on pituitary L8 sec secretion. Yes, for sure. So more or less, when somebody is very, very obese, you are going to, that person is going to aromatize more androgens into estrogens. And when your estrogens are high, that sends a signal to the pituitary, hey, our estrogens are high, produce less androgens. Because estrogens, remember, are produced from androgens via aromatase, and aromatase inhibition is what's going to hopefully, in this case, which we'll observe, increase testosterone in some of these guys, but also decrease estradiol. So the design, open, uncontrolled, six-month pilot study in 12 severely obese men. This is not a huge study, I wish it was bigger, but it isn't. Obese men with low testosterone treated with 2.5 milligrams letrozole once a week for six months. These are the results. Six weeks of treatment reduced E2 from 123 to 58 with some variation, an increased serum LH from 4.4 to 11.1 with some variation, total testosterone from 5.9 to 19.6 with variation, and free testosterone from 163 to 604 with some variation. Total testosterone rose to within normal range in all subjects, whereas free testosterone rose to super physiological levels in seven out of 12 men. The testosterone and E2 levels were stable throughout the weeks during the six month treatment. Now, I do wanna dig into the raw data here because there's some stuff in the blood work I think is interesting and worth discussing. So we pull this up right here. This is the basal blood work, the six week and the six month. So some of the stuff that stood out to me, we already know, obviously LH went way up. Um, prolactin went down a little bit. Not sure if it's statistically significant again, because this is a very small study, but I found that interesting. Prolactin went down, testosterone, free testosterone went way up. I wanna draw attention to this, total estradiol. So you can see the basal, it's 123, and that's picomoles per liter. Strange, but that's what they measured it in. At six weeks, it got cut in half, uh, over cut in half to 57. But then at six months, it went up a little bit. Okay, same thing with free estradiol. You can see 3.8 to 1.8 to 2.5 at the six month. This is interesting. Reason being is because this doesn't necessarily lend to the validity of the theory that when you use a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, there's a chance for it to become unbound and basically skyrocket estradiol. Uh, reason being is because they were on 2.5 milligrams the entire time. But what this does lend some evidence to, just lends evidence to, is that when you are crushing aromatase, your body may upregulate aromatase production. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. And again, this is a very, very small study, six month treatment. These guys were also not on testosterone replacement therapy. So those are important distinctions. But some of the crossover information that we can take from this is that it works, okay? At just 2.5 milligrams once per week, we see robust estrogen suppression for up to six months, or at least during the time of the treatment in these guys. And I think that kind of crosses over because talking to guys that actually use letrozole, and I do not know a lot of them, I just know a handful of them. These guys swear by this medication and generally they'll use it when they're having severe E2 symptoms. So they get like super red, moon face, sore, sore nipples. Letrozole is like that jump in, they use it for a couple weeks to kind of calm down any potential gynecomastia and then they go to something like anastrozole or exemestane. So not only does it work great on a milligram per milligram basis, I just dosed once per week, but in a, I guess, steroid context or what I know from guys that actually use it, it is a powerful medication that can kind of stop E2 symptoms in its track. Do I see a use case of this in a TRT context? 
I really don't, um, especially when we're gonna talk about the next session, the head-to-head -head and the safety profile of it. But in terms of just brutally lowering estradiol levels, 2.5 milligrams once per week, does a great job, but I imagine if you dose it several times per week, you could probably absolutely crush your estradiol, which we're gonna get into. So now we understand that anastrozole and letrozole are non-steroidal, non-suicide uh, aromatase inhibitors. Exemestane stands out as, this, as a suicidal aromatase inhibitor. We understand that they all work to suppress estrogen. We have more clinical research surrounding anastrozole in terms of a TRT context, as well as a use case for anastrozole in a TRT context. Now let's actually compare these things head to head. We're gonna look at a couple studies. Let's do that right now. 